an eighth grader at Peachtree, and I think he's on his fifth superintendent. So I, I, I want to be a half full person, but you know, when you're on just when you're on superintendent number five, the glass sometimes looks empty. Um, but I will say, I came out of that meeting in December, and I went to a friend of mine. I said, you know what? If he can't do it, I don't know who can. I really came out, and the glass was half full again. So I, I thank you for that. I thank you for your time, and for that reason, I really wanted him to come up here meet more um, Dunwoody citizens and for you guys to listen to him and hear some of his thoughts and some of his plans and what he's done. What he did in, in Kansas City Public Schools, I found truly amazing. Um, so at this point, I'm, Dr. Green, come on up and uh, take a few words and introduce yourself to, the, to Dunwoody. And just kind of how, how this is going to work. Um, he's going to speak for a few minutes and then this is a pure, pure question and answer. And Lynn Deutsch was kind enough, we have index cards. Um, we'd like to keep it to index cards so the same question is not asked um, in a different way five times. Um, we want to make this as succinct as possible. You guys are all busy people. You, our guests are all busy. So just we're going to let him speak for a few minutes and then we will do all questions by index cards. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Stacey. Greetings, everyone. Good to see you all here today. It's a, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I appreciate that introduction. Um, let me just give a, a, say a few preliminary comments and then I think the whole purpose of this is to allow you to ask questions and for us to uh, respond. Members of my team are here who are experts in areas that we think are questions are going to come, so um, they will be here to add depth and detail in areas where uh, we get into um, general topics that I'll, that I'll uh, frame. But um, I call your attention to the cards that, that were passed out to you because I think it's important uh, for the Cab County School District, and if you've heard me say this before, the, the district, in my estimation coming in, uh, was, was um, uh, off course, perhaps, distracted by a lot of the other kinds of things that were going on. And, and a, a school district is no different than a human being. If you're distracted and you've lost your priorities, et cetera, then you can be taken advantage of, you can get off course, you can get into trouble, et cetera. So if you make an analogy between a a human being, a child, or an adult who's lost their priorities and has been distracted by a lot of different things. And then that individual needs to s stabilize, focus, and reset priorities, as all of us have probably gone through periods of time in life like that, in which you need to reset your priorities, get focused, and get down to business, and get down to work, knowing who you are, what your purpose is, and dial in on that purpose and not be distracted or dissuaded. From that. This is the phase we're at with the Cab County School District. We know what our priorities are, and you can see the list right here on, on this sheet here of what the priorities are. Our priorities, one, SAC School Accreditation. Uh, I think I, I would invite you to give us a round of applause, give yourself a round of applause, if you achieve that. <laughs> CI Square stands for Curriculum, Instruction, Assessment, and Accountability. Um, there was when I came here, I didn't sense that there was that kind of laser-like focus on what the core business of an education organization, school district ought to be. Uh, there were other distractions, probably more time, as I've said, more time focused on what was happening in the courtroom and the classroom. And so the focus for DeKalb County School District, without a doubt, anyone will be able to tell you is about looking at the classroom, examining that classroom, improving the work in the classroom, which is our core business. Other things, and I've told this to my cabinet, uh, that I've got a chief financial officer, a chief operations officer, a, uh, other officers, etc., legal officer, but I've said, you know what, you're peripheral to the core business of teaching and learning. You support that, but that your, your office is not the focus of our work. Our focus is about curriculum instruction, assessment, accountability, improving instruction for students. So we have a sense of priority, now we have a clarity of purpose we know what we're about and we also know what we're not about so we're not going to get as you can sometimes can happen if you if you're disoriented and don't have your priorities straight you can kind of drift off into something else that is not your core business and get taken off course and get derailed and get distracted we're not about to do that um, you'll we'll have a chance to talk about that but the, the idea of the uh, OSD or the Opportunity School District, I have very strong feelings about that. Um, and our mission, and you'll hear about that today, is to uh, remove ourselves from the discussion 
around Opportunity School District because I don't think it's an opportunity at all. I don't think it's an opportunity for us or our children. It may be an opportunity for somebody, but it's not an opportunity for, for us. Um, compensation, fair and competitive compensation, I hope you realized and probably heard about, and it's just a step in the right direction, uh, but um, we were able to devote um, just over the half of the year, a little over uh, $10 million into, and we invested that $10 million into our teachers. And that turns out to be annualized over the course of the year, $21 million investment in terms of being more competitive and attracting our te teachers who will be here and work with our children. Because we realized as we compare ourselves across the market that we were not competitive and we were losing and hemorrhaging in many ways, losing teachers uh, to other districts and neighboring districts. So I share that with you to um, uh, just, just to indicate that uh, we're on a wellness program. We're seeking to rehabilitate. We're seeking to get better. Um, we have a lot of areas to, to work on to get stronger uh, as we go, as we continue that process. Um, but I will tell you this, that the prospect and the prognosis for this patient called the Cab County School District is good. And um, with your help, we will continue to get stronger and better each and every day. So I will uh, conclude my remarks and uh, leave the opportunity for questions. So I have four that I know probably a lot of people have. Um, the first one is going to be SPLOST 5. There's a lot of concern as to the lack of specifics in SPLOST 5. So could you speak to how exactly you want to see it worded and why? The, uh, the SPLOST 5 is, is, and I understand it's going to be a little bit different this year than it's been in the past, uh, mainly because we're, uh, the timetable was pushed up early. Um, the history has been that the four uh, districts have gone together, Bolton, DeKalb, City of Decatur, and Atlanta Public Schools have gone together. Um, uh, there was a, uh, in, in the first meeting I went to with the four districts, there was a clear uh, focus on moving to a May uh, timeline. Uh, I struggled with that considerably, uh, but the options were either May or March of 17, May of 16, March of 17. There was a desire on all four districts, at least particularly with the other three districts, was to not get caught up in the quagmire of the uh, November election. Uh, a number of things were going to be going on on the presidential election, but also more things going on with regard to um, the OSD, uh, other things that were going to be going on, maybe the martyr tax, et cetera. So that compressed our timeline. And so the, the, the thinking was, and I spoke with many, many board members, many others, about whether which was the right way to go. Um, stay with the pack, stay with the group, which is going, clearly everything was going in, in May of, of 16, or to wait until March of 17. But then we would be going alone by ourselves. And so uh, I made the decision after talking to a lot of different individuals that we will stay, we would stay with the pack. What that meant is that we would go back with a general, here are general buckets or general areas that we would be before the vote, then have the stakeholder engagement after the vote. Um, and then we have extensive time between May of 16 all the way up till December before we would bring it to the board for stakeholder engagement actually shaping the details, what the actual list would look like. But there's some clearly big areas of addressing overcrowding, technology, uh, certain areas that cut across the entire district that we would certainly want to get on, uh, uh, get, get at least clarity on as far as no, agree that those are priorities, then we decide what the details look like after the vote. So that was why it's structured the way it is. Um, it's not the ideal situation. We were set for a November timeline, but once we decided not to go in November, then it's either going later, or going early, or going by ourselves, or going with the group. So we had to structure. Just so I can understand my mind. Okay, so when we go to vote in May, will it say the SPLOST will address overcrowding, increase technology, or is it just going to say SPLOST yes or no? Well, uh, my chief, I mean, my chief uh, operations officer will speak to the details, but it will have much more specificity than that. It will say that we're looking at addressing overcrowding in the cabinet. 
County School District. It will say we're looking at technology across the board and expanding our, not only our bandwidth, but expanding our resources. So you want to speak to that? This is uh, Mr. Joshua Williams. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Joshua Williams, as Dr. Green mentioned, the uh, current resolution that was approved by the board on the 1st of February actually has five key primary paragraphs. Uh, those paragraphs focus uh, primarily, paragraph one focused primarily on safety and security, and the language that's noted in there is to ensure that we have the ability to make any improvements relative to safety and security uh, throughout the district for any uh, facility. The second paragraph focuses primarily on new additions and new facilities as it relates to overcrowding, uh, adding or modifying or replacing or even reconfiguring uh, local schools as it relates to creating new schools or facilities or accommodate current and future enrollment, develop early childhood centers, uh, enhance regional supports, uh, address major facility conditions in the event that a facility has uh, essentially the building systems have reached their useful life that require us to actually tear down and replace that facility that's part of that second paragraph as well as accommodate expanded programming needs throughout the district. Paragraph three uh, in the resolution essentially uh, supports the facility condition improvements and essentially what that is these are uh, areas relative that need renovating or modifying or upgrades or improvements to the major building systems be it HVAC systems uh, plumbing systems, electrical systems uh, throughout the schools. It also allows us to make improvements to the athletic fields and physical conditions at our middle and high schools as well. In addition to ADA renovations that are needed at, at several of our schools, uh, repaving, infrastructure and improvements, restroom facility upgrades, as well as any type of environmental or air quality control issues that need to be addressed at schools and several other areas um, related to health, safety, and applicable building codes. The fourth paragraph, as Dr. Green mentioned, primarily focuses on technology improvements and upgrades, and specifically as it relates to the replacement of and enhancement of our technology systems, specifically also related to our enterprise resource management software, or our ERP, our, our ability to be able to connect both HR and finance systems into one system that allows us to communicate throughout the district. Uh, another component that is a part of this is what we consider a a capital purchase or capital equipment purchase and replacement or supplement a paragraph, which is the final paragraph five here, where we will look at replacing, purchasing, upgrading, or refurbishing uh, local school buses, as well as other support vehicles and other capital equipment to include uh, desks, chairs, tables uh, for students, as well as instructional equipment, band equipment, kitchen equipment, uh, waste compactors as needed, modular facilities, um, in addition to custodial equipment or grounds equipment, et cetera. And this gives us the, the ability to do this at all of the schools and centers throughout the school district. So as Dr. Green mentioned, there is a very high level um, perspective as it relates to the categories. And those categories have uh, assigned buckets or values of dollars that are associated with them. And then as we go through this formal stakeholder process after the vote will allow us to actually put the meat on the bones, if you will. I'll kind of give you a little bit of an overview of what that looks like. So for example, the board approved on February 1st the actual resolution that will go before uh, the voters on the uh, May 2016 ballot. Uh, in, June of, in June and July, I'm sorry, we'll actually publish and provide all of the supplemental data relative to what we consider our secondary school uh, feasibility study. What that's looking at are whether or not there's capacity issues in certain areas of the district uh, specifically as it relates to the Cross Keys Cluster as well as in Region 1 and Region 2. And what type of needs do we need as it relates to that middle school and, and high school areas in order to provide those improvements. And we'll be using that, that paragraph 2, if you will, for new additions and replacement facilities to support that. In March, um, around the 24th or so, we plan to actually publish uh, a lot of the data that will be used as we work through this process. So you'll have what we consider our feasibility um, study data that I mentioned in June and July, but in March we'll also have what we consider our facility condition data, as well as our facility educational adequacy data, uh, enrollment data, and all of these data points will be used to provide to the community so that we can have a more um, detailed discussion around what those data points look like and how they'll be used in order to create the more specific project list. In July and also in September, we'll have two rounds of public engagement. This public engagement will center around the discussion around how these data points will be used to create this specific list. 
there will be regional meetings as well as formal stakeholder engagement meetings that we'll hold during that time period. Around November 7th, the team will take that stakeholder engagement in conjunction with the uh, data that we have. We'll actually present to the board through the superintendent a proposed recommended specific detailed project list that will go for the board for their review. In December of 2016, we'll then come back and actually ask the board to formally approve it based on feedback that we received during that November board meeting. A few other key dates that may be important. Um, as I mentioned before, the May 24th, uh, 2016 is the actual split, uh, vote for the referendum. Uh, we'll conclude those public uh, engagement sessions around September, and as I stated, um, we'll be able to bring forth the formal specific list and the actual collections for the SPLOS for the 2017 through 2022 20, uh, will start in July of 2017. So that's kind of a high level overview of the process that we'll take as it relates to coming to a more detailed specific project list. And we certainly look forward to engaging the community and the public as it relates to um, this process as we work through this uh, over the next several months. Um, before we get to the next question, if you have one, um, Lynn will pick it up. And I also want to thank the principals who are here. Um, Ann Colbreth from Austin, Veronica Williams from Chestnut, and Scott Heppenstall from Peachtree. Thank you for your time. It always, it's, it goes above and beyond, and we thank you. All right. Next question. I needed my readers. <laughs> Dr. Green, welcome and thank you for addressing our community. Peachtree Middle has 12 portables with more than one in five students in classrooms outside the building. Next year, Peachy will have 16 portables, more than one in four students outside the building. Larger numbers are coming up from K through five. What is the plan for Peachy overcrowding? That's no, question number one. Question number two, overcrowded Cross Keys is slated for two new elementary since SPLOS 5, which they desperately need. Cross Keys also really needs a new middle school and high school too. Have you considered adding a new middle school and high school to Cross Keys, Dor Cross Keys Doraville area and building it with a 1900 capacity large enough to feed Doraville students to relieve Peachtree. And also just in related, um, a question on the Dunwoody Elementary, that they will be receiving six to eight trailers and where the trailers are going to be placed. So if you could address the overall overcrowding, especially Peachtree and Cross Keys. I'll make a general comment here and then Dan Drake, who's been um, just, in fact, he gave me a briefing of uh, a PowerPoint that's gonna be coming out to share with you our, our effort based on community feedback and uh, hearing what the public wanted, uh, where we are with round two of addressing overcrowding for cross keys. Uh, and not only just cross keys, but overall as we see the growth happening, particularly here in the north and what that's gonna mean. Um, what I've commissioned uh, the team to do, both Mr. Williams, our COO, and Mr. Dan Drake, is to uh, wean ourselves of the dependence on portables or trailers. Uh, that's going to be a daunting task. That's going to be something that is going to take a lot of work. Um, but I've asked them to accelerate the effort. You will see the results of that. It's going to break down into three phases, but it's also going to challenge all of us. It's going to challenge us to think about what, what, what redistricting needs to look like, what maybe even reclustering may need to look like down the line. But right now, what we're going to do is what, what we can do in terms of what the resources we have, looking at Kerry Reynolds, Dresden, those elementary schools, that's where the bubble is right now, and what we can do aggressively to uh, reduce our dependence on those portable classrooms early, and then we've got a very aggressive plan going forward, but we all have to have a good conversation about that outcome, and because we're not just gonna arbitrarily make that decision by ourselves, we're gonna include you in that process, and you're gonna help us make that decision, and make, hopefully it'll be the right decision for the community, not only now, but in the future. And so I asked to, to, to the peach tree question, I'll ask Mr. Dan Drake, who's our specialist in that area, to talk about what our plan is. Thank you. Uh, as far as the overcrowding at Peach Street Middle School, um, as well as the, the second question about introducing a, a new high school or middle school in the Doraville area, those two questions are actually related to each other. There is the, uh, as Mr. Williams uh, mentioned, um, and the superintendent alluded to, there's something called the secondary school feasi feasibility planning study. Secondary school meaning middle schools and high schools in region one and region two. So that's Dunwoody, Chambly, Cross Keys, Lakeside, Tucker, uh, Druid Hills, and as well as Clarkston. Those seven clusters, we're looking specifically at the overcrowding at the middle schools and high schools. 
the seven middle schools and the seven high schools in those seven clusters. Um, the majority of those are overcrowded, existing and or will be overcrowded over the years. So this secondary study will be kicking off next month in March. Um, we will be announcing dates sometime in the next few weeks for, those, for that study. That study will be looking at what needs to be done at Peachtree Middle School. What needs to be done at Dunwoody High School? What needs to be done at Sequoia Middle School, Cross Keys High School? Those questions are interrelated. And it's interrelated to that very question about if we do, do we, dis, do we develop a new cluster? Do we do, do develop a new high school, a new middle school? If that, then you may not need to over, it may, need, may not need to add an addition to Peachtree Middle School or Cross Keys or Sequoia and, and all this. So we're looking for a robust discussion with the community all seven clusters uh, um, to, to go through that discussion and to figure out where we need to be going. And all of those improvements will be funded by the, the next BLOSS vote. And so it's, it's, it's not magic money, it's, it, it ha will have to be funded from somewhere and that's that BLOSS vote that we, that we also talked about. Um, Dunwoody Elementary, as far as Dunwoody Elementary, um, There, there are, there, Dunwoody Elementary will be needing uh, trailers for next year, and we um, have not gone out yet and identified the location of those, but we, we, we can give an update when we do, but that's something we'll be looking at towards the end of this month um, as we look at the uh, affordable uh, location for each of the schools. And we are aware of that um, um, at, at Dunwoody Elementary. Thank you. Hi. Um, next question. Why is it taking so long to get test results back? Six months for Georgia milestone, Milestones, four months for PSAT. Students lose instruction time for diagnostic te tests whose results come too late to be useful. Uh, yes, um, well, um, I think in, but, but I think the, uh, I think we have to look to the, to the state to help us with that in terms of when, with the Georgia Milestones. The Georgia Milestones were relatively new, um, and uh, I think they had to do some work with them before they gave them to us. What I can promise to you, as soon as we get them, we will make sure that the public gets them. I think it'll get faster as it goes forward, but this was the first year for the Georgia Milestone, um, and I think the State Department uh, was challenged in that area. I have to harken back to my uh, former, employee, and former employer, uh, the College Board, with the PSAT, because that's who designs that. Okay, sir, if the legislation to reduce the millage rate in DeKalb County passes at the State House, what do you see the implications on the school system being? Well, that's speculative. Um, so that's if. And um, let me just say there's a big difference between if and when. It's a big distance between if and when. But if it would, it would not be good for us. If, if it would, it would be not, not good for us. All things considered, the difference between if and when. For too long in DC, uh, SS, a child's education experience has been impacted for better or for worse by the quality of the principal and school leadership team. There is a huge range of quality in the schoolhouse. What is your plan to improve school-based leadership? Well, and I think it's ties to another question that may come about as well. Um, I'm about outcomes and results. And the accountability system, I think, not having a curriculum and not having a mean, means to monitor and measure the quality of instruction has put us at a disadvantage. Building a system that we are putting in place to actually examine teaching and learning and hold everyone accountable, including myself, to increase the student outcomes for teaching and learning will be uh, a big part of that. And it will help us better understand um, who should be here and who should not be here. Um, when you're distracted, I'll go back to that with my beginning comment. When an organization like a school district is distracted, people who are not necessarily of the caliber you want can hide in the system. They can actually get away and get a paycheck and you will never notice that they're there because you're not organized enough and you're not structured enough, you can't hold them accountable. So the whole idea of building the system of accountability, remember CIA Square, curriculum, instruction, assessment, and accountability is to open, is to turn the light on, to illuminate. It's an MRI scan, if you will, and if there are areas, and, there, and we know they're probably here in our school district, where there are areas where the leadership is not sufficient. Uh, that will give us the uh, leverage we need 
put the system in place to either coach them up or coach them out. <coughs> Are you in support or opposition of independent school systems? If you support them, why? And if opposed, how do you think DCSD has proven that larger is better? Okay, independent, I'm sure I'm not sure what they mean by independent school systems uh, on that. But if this is, so the school wrote the question, can they clarify? Oh, okay. Oh, okay, I, I get it now. Um, well, I guess, no, I'm not in favor of, uh, of uh, I love, uh, independence is, is okay, but I mean, if you're talking about separate, uh, as far as um, um, a separate school system, segregation, is that, is that what we're talking about? Like just, just cessation, like. Just like Okay, well, given my position, no, I'm not in favor of breaking up the school district. If that's what that's about in terms of into pieces and, and having it um, be independent and separate. Um, no, I'm not necessarily in favor of that. I think that uh, I think our challenge is, is to be a large school district to feel small on the other end. And uh, one of the things, and that's the area of customer service. And I think that we have not done a good job in that area, and I think it's our responsibility to, to man up and own up to uh, areas where we have not been as um, uh, customer friendly and as customer sensitive as we should be, and to make this district as large as it is feel small. Um, and uh, that means we've got to do a better job of responsiveness uh, to customer concerns, to uh, parent concerns, to stakeholder concerns, etc. Even if it's, and I've told my team this, even if it's the answer that that is not agreeable to the person that you're responding to, you, you have an obligation to get back to people and respond to them and engage with them. And we have not done that. that but when I stepped into this, I've, got, I've heard much and much about people uh, sometimes not returning phone calls, not returning emails, not getting back, etc. And I have no tolerance for that. My team knows I have no tolerance for that, and it's starting to run its course across the school district uh, in terms of how I feel about that and what I expect about that. We still have a long way to go in that in this area. I've picked certain areas where I know it's not happening and have made examples of those areas, i.e. exceptional ed, i.e. Title I, where things have flagged and not worked well. We've made some progress, but we still have a long way to go. But I am in favor of keeping the Cab County School District intact with its diversity, and we just have to do a better job of I, I want to thank you because I have seen a drastic difference in communication back. I'll say as far as facilities, it's phenomenal. Instant calls back, emails back. In special ed today, actually, I called and I got a call back within an hour and they were fantastic. So I commend you for that and I hope you I want to hear, we're going to do more of that. Populations, say 30, 40, approaching 50 percent. But under DeKalb's formula, they're not eligible for Title I. And our cluster, an example, is Kingsley, which in October was not eligible, but by December was. So they missed the funding, I guess, for the year. And is there anything specifically that can be done for Kingsley? And in a broader picture, because Paige and many people in this room who are old timers like me, we've been talking about it for a long time, that a school that has 35 or 40 percent poverty has a fairly significant need but gets no additional resources, um, whereas one that is in the 50s gets the Title I funding. And so we'd love to hear your specifics for Kingsley, if possible, and broader for the system as a whole for these, especially elementary, middle, and well, I guess it's even high school now that teeter on that edge. Right. Let me just make a general comment. Dr. Morsi Beasley, who oversees our title program, will talk a little bit about it. But I'm I'm a strong advocate for more flexibility. I think that's coming to us soon, more flexibility with Title I dollars. And so uh, I think the, the ability to do more, these are federal dollars, and so because they're federal dollars, they come with 
uh, for want of a better term, strings attached and restrictions and constraints, and you've got to honor those or you lose the money altogether. So uh, in that regard, um, I think that the, the collective voice of other school districts uh, across this country have has at least been heard and is registering because we're hearing about more flexibility uh, with the, the title dollars in terms of that threshold of being you have to have it 60% or higher. But Dr. Beasley heads up our area, uh, work in that area. Let's have him talk about it. Thank you, Dr. Green. Uh, you should know relative to Kingsley in particular, the cab uses a cutoff of 52%. That decision is made by our superintendent. So we'll present to him scenarios relative to funding for next year. And if the schools are at that level of poverty, using our free and reduced lunch rates, then that school will be included in Title I funding. The, the balance there is as you increase the number of schools, then the funding basically is spread out over more schools. So wherein schools may have used their Title I funding for additional teachers to reduce class sizes, they may not have as much funding if they were uh, Title I or they use those funds prior to adding additional schools. So it's a it's a balance that the district has to has to really uh, fulfill relative to the funds because we're expecting probably a drop in funding. We at least plan for a drop in funding, and hopefully it won't be as much as we plan for. But it's a possibility. But we do this year our Title One cutoff was 52 percent. We'll present scenarios in the next month or so to Dr. Green to determine where we should land for next year. And of course, they'll have all the schools, their free and reduced lunch rates, and a decision will be made. You should know that if a school is Title I, identified for the first year as Title I, it's a targeted assisted school, which means that the funds are only identified to assist the students that need the funds the most, uh, not the entire uh, school. For the schools that are not Title I, we have been fortunate through our superintendent and our board, we have been fortunate to provide funds for additional tutorials. We call it the Student Success Tutor Initiative. So if they don't have Title I funds, all they have to do is submit a proposal, even if they need transportation. We provide funding for the teachers to be paid, for the tutors to be paid, and we provide funding for the transportation. And many of the schools are taking advantage of those funds. And of course, we also provide addition, we, we have a budget need use it for the OSD schools, but it, Dr. Green gives us a little flexibility. If we see that there's a need based upon the poverty rate at the school that they may not have Title I funds, we will support and we have supported those schools. Of course, Ms. Brixton uses her budget many times, the CNI budget, to support schools who may need additional resources as well. The president just submitted his, his uh, fiscal year 17 budget, so more information to come there. We are expecting to see a, a bit more uh, flexibility, as Dr. Green shared, relative to the use of Title I funds, and so we'll keep you posted. So Kingsley will be in the discussion, and I look for um, Kingsley to submit his proposal for what uh, we could possibly do in that area. Teacher retention. How do you plan to attract the best teachers, both young ones and those with experience, that may be ready to leave DCSD for other county schools. And I know I speak from personal experience, there is nothing that pisses me off more to see a good teacher leave to, to Fulder Gwinnett, right? And you're just like, Ugh! So what is the plan to retain them? I'll, sh I'll share with you kind of my, my strategy on that. Uh, I think we're gonna reverse the tide the other way quite a bit. So I think this community needs to be braced for uh, people being mad at us for taking I think, given some of the some of the some of the things that I've seen going on in my neighboring uh, school districts, there uh, we're we're getting people knocking at the door when it comes to camp. Part, partly because you know, that compensation piece got out pretty quickly in terms of, and, and, and that's not just for the short term. That tw that twenty one million dollars is just the beginning. Uh, we'll turn our attention to uh, classified staff in the summer, and then we'll come back around to our teachers again, and we will. We will invest in them. So it's a human capital investment. Uh, so I think you start off by being competitive on the salary range because we were way out of uh, uh, and we were losing. And that's the hemorrhaging I was talking about because, uh, you know, someone was saying, why well, I go next door and don't have to move and make $15,000 more. Uh, but it's not all about the money. It's also about how well we treat our teachers. It's about how well we support them. 
that uh, assessment system, that CI Square, is not only just about holding them accountable, but it's high support. And so we have the professional development dollars, we have the resources to support our teachers in the class every day. So uh, maybe perhaps there was an excuse when we weren't paying as well, and so people could but, you know, take their eye off the ball, but not here, not now. And so we're willing to put our money where our mouth is. The surplus that you see on the card there of uh, the uh, that $92.8 million fund balance, that's going to be recycled back into our workforce, back into programs that we need for our children. Uh, so I think by that, by doing that and doing the right thing and staying focused and staying, uh, 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 this whole uh, issue of being distracted and being in the media for the wrong reasons, I think the, the reducing those and, and, and dialing in and being focused will allow us to better uh, attract teachers and keep people here. There are other kinds of things that we're doing, and I'll, I'll invite the, Dr. Brown to come up and talk a little bit about that. He's our new uh, Human Capital Management uh, Chief, and he will share with you, and he, and, and he has an extensive background in Human Capital Management and HR, and he will share with you some of the recruitment measures that we're taking into effect to uh, catch students, catch graduates as they come off the stage at Emory, <laughs> catch them as they come off the stage at Georgia State, Georgia Tech, and say, here is an opportunity. Sign with us now. Your life will be better for it. Go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Green. Good evening. I am Leo McCauley Brown. I do have the pleasure of serving as the Interim Chief Human Capital Officer for the Cap County School District. Dr. Green, you stole a bit of my thunder, but that's okay. Uh, it's funny, on my very first day on the job, I said, are we offering teachers jobs as soon as they graduate? Like the minute they get their diploma, are they getting a statement of acceptance in their hand? And I got deer in headlights, no we weren't. Well, that's something that we need to do, so we're gonna be looking to do that because uh, there's the research around teacher retention, and part of the research indicates that uh, teachers are likely to continue working in the school district when they feel wanted and appreciated, and part of that starts with before they even set foot in the classroom before they even set foot and meet their principal. So if we let them know, we want you, we appreciate you already for even going into the teaching field because we know there's a lot of intrinsic benefits that they receive from that, and we need to honor that. And so we are going to look at that. There's other things that we're, we're looking to do uh, as it relates to creating culture and environment and organizational development as it relates to our schools and uh, working with our principals to ensure effective leaders and they have the capacity to do those types of things and coaching that we are looking at doing to bring those services to the schoolhouse so that, of course, the ultimate benefactor of those services are our students. Not only for teachers, though, but for all of our employees, whether they are custodians, whether they are bus drivers, whether they are administrative assistants, whatever employee that we have in the school district, we want to be sure that we do the best of our ability and do our best to serve them and to retain them. So, just so you know, I was in a meeting recently with my counterparts in other school districts in our surrounding metro Atlanta area, and we all, to a number, said that teacher retention was high on our radar. So we had a, I won't say a gentleman's agreement, I'll say a gentle person's agreement, that we would not accept a teacher uh, who is in the middle of a contract from another school district. And so just recently, we turned down four teachers from other school districts who were in the middle of their contract who were trying to break their contract in one school district just to come here to make more money, Dr. Green. <laughs> and conversely, they've endeavored to do the same thing. They will not, they will not bring um, teachers who are in the middle of a contract uh, onto their school, into their school, school districts, into their schools, who are breaking the contract into CAD. Now for the majority, for the, the overwhelming majority of Metro Atlanta County school districts, we have all agreed to do this, with the exception of one, and I will not name that, for fear of public incrimination. <laughs> because this was a gentle person's agreement and that's what a gentle person will do. Uh, but our office is open. I, I had a conversation with the teacher today. We had a new teacher event um, and it was, a, it was a blast. We have, we have donors and sponsors from across the community who give um, Kroger gift cards. We had Hillsburg Diamonds who gave a diamond necklace away uh, as door prizes for our teachers. We have our sponsors who come in. And that's, that's one of the things that we need to continue to do to publicize. Uh, to let people know that, hey, we value our teachers, and that's a way to retain them. So we have a very robust recruiting strategy that starts uh, at the beginning of the fiscal year and on up into uh, our key recruiting season, which is June and July. And so we do a lot of things that we probably don't do a good job of publicizing, uh, but no one can tell our story better than we can, so we'll make sure that you continue to get that information 
we've endeavored to communicate that with our Board of Education recently in our most recent board meeting, so we'll continue to do that. Uh, but we do a lot of things good, and we'll do more things even better as we continue to go on. Uh, what questions do you have? Just ask, let me add to that just a little bit. Uh, another part of retaining good teachers is making sure that those who are not necessarily as dedicated to the profession uh, and those who are not as uh, committed um, are not um, allowed to stay. talks about this in good to great. You have level five leaders. Those level five top caliber people are looking for the, their leader to make tough decisions around the level two and one folks. And you run the risk of losing your level five folks if you let level two and one folks stay around. So part of our effort in recruiting and retaining is, is, being, is putting the x-ray on uh, our, our school system and on our personnel and uh, and I think the board's gonna give me some flexibility into helping some people leave if they need to leave, or early outs, and some other kinds of things that we're gonna be looking at to uh, put the workforce in the areas where it's not strong. We're gonna take a little break, and we'll be right back. Uh, I would like to discuss increasing recess time to 30 minutes. <laughs> There's, there's been some research on that uh, and uh, how much time, particularly our elementary school students should have in our school day, et cetera. And uh, I'll just say that I'm willing to look at that uh, and, and look, willing to look at what resource time can, re recess time can be increased. Um, I know that they're supposed to have, what is it, uh, 15 minutes. 10 minutes? They used to have 30, I don't know what happened. Yeah. But, but I'm certainly willing to examine that as long as it you know, doesn't necessarily totally infringe on instructional time. But we, I, I'm a believer in healthy mind, healthy body, the, getting the cardiovascular, especially dealing with obesity and the kinds of things that we're facing uh, with our young people, et cetera, and the onset of you know, other diseases that stem from obesity. So I'm for, sort of willing to look at that, but I, I admit I'm not as familiar with exactly where we are. And resets, especially in elementary school, helps those kids prepare their brains for that next step in learning. Um, so the group that we've helped organize, is there a way to sit down, we've been in contact with Mr. Jester, is there a way to sit down with someone in the district to discuss the research we have and the evidence we have through you know, personal experience and, um, and other successful school systems and states out there to help bring it to the cab? It's a free way to really Hopefully, create improvement overall with our students. Yeah, I'd like to do that. I'd like to have that conversation. I'd like to learn more about it. So, um, why don't we, uh, I don't know, Ms. Tithia, Ms. Brixton? Yeah, and, 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 and then with, uh, I know you, ma'am. My assistant, Jeff. I will call you to talk after this. We'll set, we'll set up a meeting. And I want to you know, be in that meeting and learn and listen as well. Um, you know, <coughs> it may be that we have to appeal to Justin Jeff. Uh, Justin, you know, Justin, you know, you know, Justin, 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 you to accommodate, I'm not sure, or maybe you can fit it within the current school day. Yeah. But you, I, I'll look to learn from yeah, you. Yeah, we can talk about that. Yeah. yeah okay. okay. Thank you. So along those lines, tying in with sort of the recess question and really the city school system question, is what is your stand on delegating real authority to local principals and or regional coordinators related to budget, hiring, firing, subcontracting services? Etc. And so recess is a good example because there may be some schools that today could work 30 minutes in at their elementary school. Um, you know, you can have a minimum, but no maximum, perhaps. You know, if you give principals the authority and hold them accountable um, for, for the for the, high, well, the hiring and firing too, but in terms of things like that. So. Yes, uh, I think you look at my history. 
history in Kansas City and New York City, but particularly more recently Kansas City, you'll see that I'm, a, I'm an advocate for uh, autonomy. I'm an advocate for, but not just autonomy in and of itself, for earned autonomy. Um, and so performance, uh, better performance to me opens the door for more autonomy. Um, uh, performance that is under subpar gets more prescriptive with me. And so, um, the, so the, for me, I'm looking at a range of autonomy uh, options that uh, were, but uh, certainly uh, uh, I'm in favor of, uh, and, and the decentralized model that, uh, that we're embarking upon now is evidence of my commitment to autonomy. Uh, I'm pushing more resources closer to the regions. I'm treating my regional superintendents as superintendents, and they will have their own HR, they will have their own IT, they will have their own in the region baked into the region where I'm expecting them to be decision makers and operate as regional superintendents and not as conduits where they have to pass information up to me or down, but they have to keep me in the loop and they have to make decisions. Uh, so I'm, a, I am, I, I'm an advocate of shared leadership and delegating authority, but I'm on high accountability and I have no tolerance for people abusing autonomy in a way to, uh, to create segregation and separation and fraction fracture. So earned autonomy is my approach and um, the more that uh, an individual or principal or whomever has in terms of hiring, etc., the more uh, responsibility and opportunity they have to be autonomous, the more, the higher their expectation that they deliver the outcomes. But I don't, I will not along, go along with low outcomes and high autonomy. You knew this question was coming. Austin Elementary. <laughs> when will our much needed 900 student elementary Austin be finished and where? Yeah. Coming soon to a theater <laughs> near you. Austin Elementary, uh, we're pleased to say Mr. Drake is coming up here to, to add some of the detail to it, but we've been in conversation uh, with the city of Dunwoody and um, uh, I can't give a little bit more detail than I could the last time because we could kind of talk about some things. We couldn't before because we were in negotiations, but I think uh, I think you'll be pleased with the outcome. Those who were looking for, and these were the specs that I was hearing. One, no displacement or swing space for this, this you know, the, in other words, the school, the student having to go to another place other than the current Austin. That won't happen. They will be staying there in Austin while their new school is being built and it will be on Roberts Road uh, in the park area. You wanna come up and talk about that, Mr. Drake? Uh, we are, we're in current uh, negotiations right now uh, on the, as far as, uh, the, as far as the tear down and rebuild uh, of the Austin Elementary School that would allow it to happen at the, so that the students would, would, would swing in place and at this point um, we are, say we're a few months away from our final negotiations with the city on that so um, it's it is, it is exciting and something that we're looking at um, right now with, with the city so what's the timeline the time frame is that if we are able to it's it's two years from when we have identified when we have a solid uh, piece of property whether it's built on site or nearby once that's identified if we're done if we're within a two years window so if we get that done by say June July we should be able to have a, a tentative opening date of, the, of August of 18, so the fall of 18. If it takes a little bit longer, that may get pushed back to the fall of 19 or something we're in between the two. Okay, it is 6.34, I have three remaining questions, and so we can wrap it up by quarter tell or slowly before, before. Okay, yeah. Someone's question was not able to be answered. If we can, can have the cards, Absolutely. and then we will type up responses to those questions. So if your question, if your card didn't get read, etc., we can still get around that. Right. Yeah, we'll, we'll respond to it that way. Right. Yeah. Members of my team, you want to meet them now? Yeah. Okay. Members of my team, there. So we'll just go around here. Good evening. I am Mike Bell. I'm the CFO. Good evening, Dan Jury, Director of Planning Supplies Programming. Good evening again, Joshua Williams, Chief Operating Officer. Cynthia Brixton, Interim Deputy Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction. 
Knox Phillips, Director for Research Assessments and Grants. Good evening, more CSPs, the Executive Director for Federal Programs, School Improvement, and I work with the OSD schools and the District Effectiveness Team. Jennifer Hackmeyer, Chief Legal Officer. Trent Arnold, Regional Superintendent, Region 2. Rachel Ziegler, Regional Superintendent, Region 3. Jennifer Hackmeyer, Chief Legal Officer. Gary Bradley, Chief Information Officer. Massey Ann Tinsley, Deputy Superintendent, Student Support and Intervention. Ramona Tyson, Chief of Staff. Good evening, Eileen Houston Stewart. I'm the Chief of Communications and Community Relations Officer, and I'm day two on the job. Welcome <laughs> me to the <laughs> ATL. Good evening, Dan Lee, I'm Holly Brown. Gwen Hudson, Director of Communications. Good evening, everyone. I'm Rebecca Jackson. I'm your interim Region 1 Superintendent. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ann Colbreth, Principal of Austin. <laughs> okay. As you acknowledge, the North is where the growth is. How can you guarantee that the board will vote for a plan that has little to no building in the South? And I guess it kind of goes to when you do the redistricting and look at the schools that are underpopulated versus overpopulated. The vast majority are certainly in the north. So how, when you look at a plan for SPLOS 5, can you guarantee that the building will actually take place where it needs to be? Guarantees, I don't know about guarantees. I can't guarantee the board <laughs> to anything. But what I can do is, and I think you can hear our approach, it's, it's, a, it's a need based approach. And so um, we will be strong drivers uh, to support, and we will follow the demographics. Uh, the, the, the two studies that you heard that are gonna be done, the feasibility study and the condition study will drive the process. It will drive, our, will drive their recommendation to me, my team's recommendation to me, and my recommendation to the board. And it'll be then on the board's uh, shoulders to respond to the recommendation that we make based on the facts, based on empirical data, not on policy. Okay, two more. Mr. McFerrin and his team do a very good job at Dunwoody High School. Yay. I know. <laughs> my husband actually graduated from this high school as well. I did not, and, and my son will be a freshman here and he's looking forward to it. However, Dunwoody families do not like the fact that buildings, facilities, and technology are not equal to other schools such as Shambly High School, Tucker, or many other schools such as Miller Grove. What do you say to many who believe that DeKalb County Schools has never paid equal attention and adequate attention to Dunwoody High and never will. Why should we stay, why should we stay with DCSS instead of privatizing Dunwoody Schools or creating a new county in North Atlanta, as has been discussed? So basically, what would you say to somebody that more attention is paid to the South versus the North? Um, let me just say, I just categorically disagree with assumption um, I'm paying I'm here right I think this is paying attention I've been here I was here last couple months ago really I've been here in this building with this we walking this building watching the instruction so I would say that's paying attention um, with regard to the uh, um, statement I just made earlier the growth is here the, 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 the uh, demographics are going to drive what we do to invest in where the growth is. Uh, so I'm gonna be led by uh, the feasibility studies, the condition studies, the, the thing that we need to do. Uh, and, um, and, and yes, uh, we're going to upgrade our, not only just our resources, financial and human capital, but upgrade our quality of customer service. So um, my commitment is to the whole district, but. I have not taken my eye away from and will not against uh, regarding you know, the North. I'm looking at the cab as a whole, but uh, uh, I can commit to you that uh, Dunwoody and, uh, and other schools in the North will get my attention and, and get the fair share of resources that they need. So historically in DeKalb, so this marks, I don't even want to tell you how many years I've been a parent assistant, but the challenge 
has been with SWAS dollars in particular is that this is a system that started off with the first SWAS way behind in capacity. So we build new schools and we don't renovate. And when we renovate, we don't always do a very good job. When you look at, say, Fulton, where they do a much more consistent job of equally building new schools and renovating old schools, and the people who get a renovated school get an equally good product, or at least close to what the neighboring new school is. And so the premise, while there was some political language in that question and stuff, the premise is, is it's not really north and south, it's how we've used resources in the past and what we're going to do at the end of the day so that the kids, and they're going to still be at the end of this next class, kids stuck in 50 and 60 year old schools that have some semblance of a decent facility. Um, and then the kids who've had a renovation in the last five or six or ten years, including one case where there was an air conditioning contractor who didn't do a very good job, and so they still don't have great AC. Um, you know, how are we going to address those needs as you weigh the needs of the whole system? Well, clearly, um, you know, even with the resources that we will get from this, uh, we should get from SPLUS, the need exceeds the amount of money that we have. I mean, that's, so, so then that means tough decisions have to be made about prioritizing. That prioritizing is going to be done as a community. I'm not going to make arbitrarily make that decision. And so um, we will make that decision together in terms of priority, recognizing that there are limited resources. I think of, of the 500 million, what is the need dollar amount? Right now it's roughly about 2 billion. 2 billion, and we have, we're, we're looking at $500 million in the spots coming up. So, so we're gonna have to, we're, gonna, we're, we're climbing out of, and trying to get to, and I've charged Mr. Williams with getting to preventive maintenance rather than emergency response maintenance. And we've got a long way to go in that area. But um, my goal will be to try to um, at least, at the very least, uh, respond, as I said, respond to the, the studies that we have and try to uh, devote resources according to those studies. Straight. Yeah, I just wanted to say one thing about the comparison between DeKalb and Fulton specifically, is that our average age of our facilities is over 40 years old. The average age of Fulton's facilities is less than 20 years old. Not only than that, they have less students than we have. They have, they have less than 100,000 students, about 90 to 95,000 students. And their SPLOS dollars are significantly higher, significantly higher than the, than the ones that we have. I would love to be in Fulton's shoes. Love, we could provide so much. If we had less students, it's significantly amount more money. So it's, it's apples to orange comparison. Elementary bus school routes run too early and thus fewer students ride the bus. What are the chances of delayed bus pickups so that more students could ride the bus taking more traffic off the roads? Yeah. Delay could be uh, an option and I know that I've heard the call for even flipping the script and having the uh, high schoolers uh, go much later as well. Uh, some of the research is out about uh, those, those students need to sleep in longer and getting more out of them if they do, but that has its own complication. But uh, Mr. Williams, you want to talk about, uh, can we delay? Well, what I would say is uh, we're actually in our process currently where we're evaluating our plans for next school year. Uh, that is something that has come up and we're working through uh, that process to also uh, coordinate with the regional superintendents in terms of establishing a bell schedule that may holistically improve our ability to be able to provide that type of relief and support. I'm going to be working through that evaluation. We'll spend the next several months doing that, but we'll be able to come before the community and kind of share where that where that lands, if you will, uh, prior to the start. So one of the scenarios will be absolutely delay. Correct. And then we'll see how the, how the response. Correct. Is. Correct. Yes, ma'am. All right. That is um, through the vast majority of questions. If we didn't get to yours, please email it to them.